bone dry Rieslings can work really well in place of stuff like sparkling wine, where you need to cut through that fattiness, the richness of fried foods or cream or anything heavy. If you have a wine that's got a little bit of sweetness like this one does, you can play it off of things that have some chili, have some extra spice, have a little bit of heat that needs taming. The best thing about this wine is that it's not just about the sugar. It's also about the acidity. It's about how it balances itself. It walks this tightrope of sweetness and acidity that keeps it very, very fresh and very balanced. And a lot of people talk about Gewürztraminer as a pairing for spicy food. And while Gewürztraminer has one side of that tightrope, it has the sweetness, it has the aromatics. It doesn't always have enough acidity to yes. play off of that sweetness. So I generally find Riesling to be a better pair for more spicy dishes, uh, more complexity and, and freshness than Gewürztraminer or other aromatic whites with sweetness. Do you have a thirst to learn about wine? Do you love stories about wonderfully obsessive people, hauntingly beautiful places, and amusingly awkward social situations? Well, that's the blend here on the Unreserved Wine Talk podcast. I'm your host, Natalie McLean, and each week I share with you unfiltered conversations with celebrities in the wine world, as well as confessions from my own tipsy journey as I write my third book on this subject. I'm so glad you're here. Now pass me that bottle, please, and let's get started. Welcome to episode 68. Do you wonder how to pair wine and spicy foods? What happens when you turn up the heat in a dish? How does that affect wine? As I get older... I find I'm amping up the heat on my spicy dishes, and I sometimes wonder, is that a sign of a maturing palate or one that just can't taste much anymore? I think I'm going to go with the first option. However, I don't want to give up on wine with those meals. And that's where our guests on today's episode of the Unreserved Wine Talk can help us. They work together to create one of Canada's best restaurants renowned for both its food and wine. Celebrity chef and author Vikram Vij has written numerous best-selling cookbooks. He's also been on hit shows such as Chopped, Top Chef, and Dragon's Den. He's the first Indian chef to earn a sommelier degree. Head sommelier Sean Nelson also joins us on this chat. He became Western Canada's youngest advanced sommelier graduate in 2016 and is now working toward the coveted Master Sommelier designation. This conversation first aired on my regular Facebook Live video show, so occasionally you'll hear me respond to viewer questions and comments. You can join that conversation every second Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern. I'll put a link as to where you can find us in the show notes, as well as links to both Sean and Vidge's websites, social media handles, and the video version of this conversation at nataliemclean.com forward slash 68. Since our conversation, Sean Nelson has moved on to another renowned restaurant in Vancouver called Hawksworth. Now, speaking of pairing difficult dishes with wine, you can avoid these disasters when you sign up for my free online video wine class, The Five Wine and Food Pairing Mistakes That Can Ruin Your Dinner and How to Fix Them Forever. Go to nataliemclean.com forward slash class and choose a time and date that work for you. I look forward to seeing you there. Okay, on with the show. They join me now from the restaurant in Vancouver. Welcome Vikram and Sean. Namaste everybody. Hi Natalie. Hi guys. Thank you so much. Now I've just shared some of the top line details of both your backgrounds Maybe you could take a moment to fill in some of the details that I missed. Maybe if, starting with you, Vikram. To be honest with you, before I became a chef and a sommelier, I actually wanted to be a Bollywood actor. Ah, okay. And my father said, no son of mine is going to become an actor. I said, okay, I should become a chef. Because he doesn't realize it, that when the chefs open their doors at 5.30, it is our stage. We are performing. 
We are entertaining, we are laughing, we are making so much fun and having a great conversation. That is theater. That is great. I love that you've associated filmmaking with the theater of the table. My partner and I, we debated for many years, should we go to the ballet or whatever? We'd never have enough time. We think, you know what? Our theater is right here in the restaurant. We love it. So I love that you view it that way as well. And Sean, what can you fill in for us? And that's so funny too, because I, at one point as well, also wanted to be an actor. I went to film school, theater degree. At the time I was working in restaurants and I was making excuses for not going and doing acting, saying that I was on stage at the restaurant. I was practicing my craft but I, I fell in love with the hospitality industry and continued down that path until I got to where I am today. Numerous steps and growing as a, as a sommelier and as a hospitality professional. Wow. Yeah. I've heard such good things. I cannot wait to actually go to your restaurant, but it's yeah, just renowned. You. It's really, yeah, it's, 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 everybody speaks so highly of it. And I love the fact that you're top of your game in your cuisine and you take wine so seriously. I mean, you have fun with it, but you yeah. also really value wine and your wine list and so on. You were recognized, I think, by, was it Wine Enthusiast, Wine Spectator? Wine Enthusiast. Wine, wine Enthusiast, enthusiast. Yeah. yes, for, for your restaurant list. And of course, the Vancouver Wine Festival has recognized the work you do with your food and wine pairing. So that's pretty amazing. So let's talk about first the exact moment that you realized Sean, we'll throw it to you first this time, that okay. you wanted to be a sommelier, or at least to work in the wine industry, wine, hospitality, food. I started my career in the hospitality industry at the Keg Steakhouse, a very prominent steakhouse chain in Canada. So I worked there for a number of years as a dishwasher, busser, bartender, server, worked my way up. And you reach a certain point when it's just not enough. I needed more. I needed to learn more. I needed to be mentored more. So I went seeking other places to work. And I found a four diamond seafood restaurant in White Rock where I grew up that was looking for staff. And I worked under the owner and the sommelier there. And I learned a lot. And I remember one night, the manager of the owner was, was walking through the restaurant. And he saw a bottle of 1998 Leonetti Merlot from Washington State that was in the cellar. And there was a little bit of, of a leak coming from the top of the bottle. He could see wine dripping up the top. So he's like, you can't sell it. We've got to open it. We should drink it. So myself and our wine director and the owner went to the office and we opened this bottle and I tasted it and I was blown away. I didn't know wine could taste like that. I didn't know wine could do the things that that did. And it was a, a light bulb. From that point on, I was like, I have to do this. You're I have hooked. To yeah. wine. I was hooked. Absolutely. Absolutely. So Vikram, do you remember the moment exactly you knew you wanted to cook, to be a chef, to be in the food world? Well, as I said, I wanted to be an actor. So my grandfather, every day, would drink a bottle of scotch and I would go and sit on his lap and he would say, you know, when you open up a restaurant, I would like to be the bartender of your restaurant (laughs) so you could drink for free. So ever since my young age, I had this thing in my head that I wanted to open up a restaurant from my grandfather. Now, obviously, scotch being an Indian or a British drink that was used a lot, I decided to go to Austria to study and become a chef. When I went to Austria to become a chef, I realized that hard liquor was just as a drink that you had so that you could, you know, either have it beforehand or at the end. But with the food, it was the Bruno Velfinas. It was the Zweigel. It was the Blau Frankish that were like really beautiful, paired really well. And obviously at that time, Burgundy was such a big deal, whether it was the Pinot Noir or the Chardonnays. And Bordeaux. So I loved that whole wine culture and that sitting there that, you know, when the Amis Bouche comes, you have a glass of bubble. And then when, you know, the frog gras comes, then you have a little bit of sauter with it. So that matching of food and air, I almost used to feel that this is like a match made in heaven. Hmm. We are just here to enjoy it on this earth. <laughs> wow, that sounds fantastic. I was talking about this with Sean earlier, but I wish you would open a restaurant here in Ottawa. But (laughs) we need that kind of that care for the wine list with different cuisines, even where perhaps a wine industry and wine growing wasn't traditional where the cuisine grew up from. But it's just marvelous. Do you have any wines from India on your list? Well, we don't have any wines on the list right now. But I'll be honest with you, I was uh, so impressed. Four years ago, I decided to go on an India wine culinary, and there's a place called Nasik, which is outside of Bombay, that produces beautiful wines. 
So Sula is one of them. His name is Rajiv Samant. I've known him for years. And he does a fantastic job of, you know, having great souvenir blogs in Shannon. And I was just in India and all I drank was Sula because that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to support the wine country there. And I was the first one who brought the method champion to us. He had originally done it. It was beautiful. Now, is it a perfect champion? No. It wasn't a perfect sparkling white. No. But it was really, really good. And it was from my own country. Hmm. There you go. Wow. That's great. So is the industry growing pretty quickly there? Hugely. I mean, every top hotel, every top restaurant is serving really, really good wines and really promoting Indian wines because they are changing. They are working out. And a lot of these Indian winemakers have actually spent more time at University of Davis, California. They've been to different parts of the world. So their understanding of culture is that wine is supposed to be not just for the sophisticated, but for everyday drinking. And I noticed this a lot this time, that so many great restaurants are serving so many great wines and at proper temperature and with proper stem. That's important. Huh. Wow. Yeah. So you cottoned on to that early, though. I mean, your background speaks to why you're so passionate about wine. But was there anything else prompting you to, especially in the Vancouver market, to open this restaurant, but to really have wine almost as important as the food? Well, I, before that, I worked at a restaurant called Rain City Grill, which served beautiful North Pacific Northwest wines. And at that time, my manager was Peter Martin Rod, who was a great teacher and a mentor to me. So what I did was, I said, when I opened the restaurant up, I said, I'm going to only have five whites and five reds. That's it. I was going to have a huge wine list. And to be honest with you, I didn't really have the money to buy a <laughs> huge amount of wine list. So I bought four whites and five whites, and I would go to the liquor store every morning and buy four or five bottles of white, four or five bottles of reds, and I would just keep them at the back. And that's how my love for wine started. Now, after two or three years of having the restaurant, I realized that if I really wanted to talk about wine seriously, even though I knew it, I needed to challenge the sommelier program in order to get there. And I challenged it. I did fail the first time. I'll be the first one to say it because of the essays. But I came back and I rewrote my exam and I got my degree. Having said that, the point was to pair food with wine, not just Indian food with wine, because that was the cuisine that I was serving. Right, right. Fantastic. Now, Vikram, with all your television experience, Dragon's Den, Top Chef, Chopped, did wine play much of a role in any of those shows with the food and wine? I guess maybe not Dragon's Den, but was there any component of wine in those shows? Well, uh, you know, when you do Top Chef or when you do uh, Chopped Canada, even though there is no wine served at the time, as a chef, you always imagine what would this dish taste like or look like, or you play games with yourself and say, hey, how would I pair this dish with what kind of wine do you do? So it's something that you do it automatically as a fun thing to do to yourself. And I would take notes down and say, oh, I would pass this on. You know, I would have this with a German reasoning, or I would have this with a Shannon block from South Africa, just because you know that you play these games with yourself. And it's just, it's something that it keeps you exciting. Sure, Absolutely. More storytelling first. Vikram, what, <laughs> let's go to what's been the worst moment of your mm. cooking career? You have embarrassing moments. I don't think there are worst moments, there are sure. embarrassing moments. Sure. And one of the most embarrassing moments to me was I had just opened the restaurant up and a friend of mine gave me a nice bottle of red wine to enjoy it. It was like a form of saying thank you very much for your friendship and good luck. So I put the wine in the wine cellar or the wine room and I forgot about it. I was so busy running around. I think probably a few months later, he came into the restaurant and he says, uh, Vikram, just pick me a bottle of wine. Now, I didn't realize. And oh. I, didn't go <laughs> I can so see where I, this is going. Yeah. I took that bottle of wine <laughs> and I went up to the table <laughs> and then I saw his face and I realized, oh, oh, this is the wine that he gave me. So I recovered back very quickly by saying, who gave me this bottle of wine, <laughs> and I'm here to drink it with you. Oh, nice recovery. It was oh. like something that happened, Ooh. and I was like, Ooh. I felt so <laughs> That's... relieved. Yeah. Because I realized, because I was going to say, oh, here's a 19 so-and-so. I don't even remember what. I think it was an Estancia <laughs> cab or something like that. And I was going to open it for him and, and charge him like 50 bucks for it. <laughs> 
And then I realized that he had given it to me. And I went back very, really, very really quickly. That, that was one great. of the most embarrassing moments for me. That is a great story. Sean, do you have one? Ooh, like I said, like Kirk said, you have embarrassing moments. Yes. Uh, I don't think I've had any worst moments. It's always t- terrible when you spill something on someone, especially as a server or some way. I remember even this is at Midges. At the beginning, when everybody comes in, we all seat everybody and we pass around water to everybody that sits down. And so we're walking around with full trays of water glasses. And the restaurant at Granville was, was quite tense. There was not a lot of space between tables. And I remember one night this uh, woman came in and sat down. And, and just as I was walking past, she backed her chair up a little bit and bumped me. And I tipped this whole tray of water glasses. Oh, onto oh her. no. It jumped up like someone had just bitten her and <laughs> so shocked. Yeah, and that's, so that's how I started that evening. And I hope the evening got better from there. Ah, uh, wow. Okay, and we need to heal these memories now. So back to you, Vikram. <laughs> your best moments so far. There will be many more, I'm sure, of your I, I think one of my best moments was, it was a Sunday afternoon. I was at the restaurant, and I don't take reservations at the restaurant, and I really, you know, have stuck to that principle of no reservations. And an older gentleman walked in with a little cane in his hand, and another younger gentleman on his arm walked into the restaurant. And then the whole restaurant went pin drop silence, and they all turned around to see who this person was, which everybody recognized. But if I was going to give up my principles of no reservations, it was Pierre Elliott Trudeau that just walked in with Justin Trudeau. Oh. in the restaurant. Oh, wow. And everybody saw. And I went up to him and I said, uh, Mr. Trudeau, there's a 20-minute wait for a table. He said, that's okay. He went to the back. He waited. He got a table. He ate. Justin was there. You know, Trudeau was there. And as they were leaving, I went up to him and I touched his feet. <laughs> and in India, when you touch somebody's feet, it's a form of respect. Ah. A huge respect. And I said, Mr. Trudeau, I just want to say it was your policies in the 1960s that allowed immigrants like me to come into this great country called Canada and be successful at what we do. Wow. He picked me up and he kind of gave me a big hug and <laughs> said, oh, I've had Indian food lots of places. This was absolutely delicious. Oh, fantastic. And you have to understand, this was Pierre Elliott Trudeau like a quintessential prime minister of this country had just said to me that that was one of his most delicious Indian food memories. What a great story. I just buckled. I couldn't believe it. I just went home and poured myself a large glass of wine and I just gulped it down. (laughs) (laughs) Let the effect of the wine go through my body. Oh, lovely. Sean. Wow. It's the best. One of the best moments. So uh, two years ago, we did that party, the New Year's party. Yes. At the restaurant. Okay. So two years ago, just as we were we were moving restaurants, we moved from our Granville location to the Camby location. But we still had the old restaurant and we were still using it. We figured, well, we're not going to be open at Camby Street, so we might as well throw a party. So we threw a New Year's party at the old Granville space. And we invited some of our, our best guests and, and close friends and family to enjoy the gross food. And we had a big I think it was a nine liter bottle of Moet champagne that we were going to pour at midnight as a toast. That's a party. It's a big bottle to pour. That's a lot. It's, it's heavy. And so we had to decant the wine out of the bottle and then pour it into flutes and pass it around the room. And it's getting close to midnight and not everybody has sparkling wine in their hands and we're running around. We've poured all this sparkling wine and we're passing around to each person and time's ticking down and it's five seconds, four seconds three seconds to midnight and I put the last glass of stamp champagne down on someone's table and I had one glass of champagne left in my hand Perfect. on my tray. And I turned around and the clock struck midnight and everybody <laughs> raised their glass and I'm just standing there. I'm like, oh, I get to drink champagne too. <laughs> so I, nice I timing. Everybody, but it was, it was just so perfect and it was great to see everybody enjoying the atmosphere of the party and, uh, and getting to spend that New Year's Eve together was really special. So, Sometimes but, life just works out and everything yeah. clicks and comes together. So we should get into a little bit of this food and wine pairing. I've been yeah. teasing so long here. <laughs> Which pairing would you like to start with? What let's, would you? Let's talk about the Contrada. Yes. Okay. Yes. So okay. the sparkling. So we've got some uh, traditional method sparkling wine. This was yes. made by uh, the Contrado family. 
This is their Four England sparkling wine. It's made from Pinot Noir. And it's a it's a bone dry sparkling wine made in a traditional method. Mm. So offers fantastic value as opposed to champagne, which is pricey because of the limited area and the prestige involved. You have your bottle of sparkling in honor of you folks. It's a BC. Absolutely. Thank Blue you so much. Blue Mountain Brew. I love it. It's only 30 bucks and it's it's classic uh, method traditional as well. So good. Absolutely. So talk about Blue Mountain. I just tell a quick story yeah. about Blue Mountain. Sure. I love Blue Mountain and Jane and Ian for years. When I first opened the restaurant up, Jane was very, very picky about where she wanted her wines to be. Okay. She said, okay, just go ahead and buy it. And I wanted to have a Pinot Gris and a Pinot Blanc. And I remember to this day, I called her up and said, no, I used to work at Red City Grill. Now I've opened up my own restaurant up. Can I put your wine on the wine list? Now, most wineries would be so happy that you're going to buy the wine and put it on the wine list. Guess what she did? She asked me to write a little essay <laughs> why I want my food to be paid with her wine. That's and great. write a little one-page letter to her to say oh. that this is what I need to do. And then she allocated why? So I have highest respect for Jane and Ian uh, at Blue Mountain, and obviously now the kids have taken over running of the wine business, and they've done a fantastic job. I know. I love their wines. The whole lineup from Pinot Noir to Chardonnay to the sparkling, they're just top notch. Yeah. Really superb. So, Sean, what do you think we should be pairing with these sparkling wines? Well, when you're talking about sparkling wine, there's a lot of, there's a couple of things that really make it stand out. The bubbles. The bubbles are the most important part. And with our food especially, and, and with a lot of, of spicier dishes, the cleansing effect of bubbles is basically what you're getting when you drink a beer. That refreshment, that, that cleansing of the palate, that ability to go back for another bite and another sip again and again is really important because otherwise you get weighted down. You have all of this spice and fat and, and heaviness, and you don't want that. You want things to remain light and fresh. Mm -hmm. Sparkling wine can work as a great pair for anything that's been pan fried or deep fried, anything that's heavy in fat. I need foods not low calorie, as we know. Mm -hmm. So any of our dishes that are done with cream sauces or anything like that, sparkling wine has great acidity to cut through that fat. It does. So those are all really important factors in, in how to pair these wines with our food. And it works as a great pair for a lot of the dishes on the menu. And I personally love the vegetative characteristics of any, you know, old world style of bubble because I think when you get those tones of bell peppers and, and ripe, ripe, ripe vegetables, and that's what comes from a delicious bubble. Mm -hmm. I just think it works really well with the rich tomato, green, creamy style gravies, eggplants. Oh, yeah. You know, it's yeah. just a perfect, perfect berry. Okay. And do you think spice and heat somehow change the... Yeah taste or how we perceive sparkling wine at all? I don't think it changes it. I just think the idea should be is that you take a sip of your wine and it's tasty and you take a bite of your food and that's delicious. And that's the pairing it should be. The food should not overpower the wine and the wine should not overpower the food either. It's just a classic match. It's like just go and have fun with it and pretend what you feel like and what you enjoy. And I find sparkling wine is probably the most food-friendly wine on the planet. So yeah. anything that challenges wine, an egg-based dish, quiche, um, mm -hmm. artichoke, asparagus, all of these really challenging foods, sparkling wine, they meet their match. And it's just, yeah. as you said, Sean, it's the acidity, it's the bubbles, and it's that cleansing power, like an and ocean texture as well. It's great, especially when yeah. you get into really textured things like mushrooms and eggplant. Yes. Talk about mushrooms. Yeah, we just did this book called Krug as a book, and they find out one ingredient, and we chose mushrooms this year. Okay. And I had done my homework and realized that Leonard Cohen, who's a quintessential Canadian poet, loved to drink a bottle of champagne before he went onto stage okay. because wow. he enjoyed it. So I actually made a mushroom pizza where I show that he's eaten it a little bit. He's had a bottle of champagne yeah. and this, his pen is sitting right there. And I wrote a poetry and it's a beautiful photograph. And I think Krug's done a fantastic job of that. But my point is, yeah. anything that's old world with earthy tones goes really well. Oh, yeah. wow. No wonder um, Cohen was so fluid, shall we say, on stage. 
uh, the lyrics just flowed. I think that bottle of Krug was probably helping, or champagne, I should say. So are there any wines that really are a disaster with spicy or hotter dishes? My theory has been, I mean, I don't think there are many sommeliers in the world or many people in this world who can, after having, you know, taken a bite of a chicken curry or a lamb curry, can say, that, oh my God, I'm having a 1965 silver oak cab. I mean, it's a little tough. I mean, your palate has to be really sophisticated. So I think that the disaster would be is if you're buying really old wine at that old, old value and expecting that to pair beautifully with Indian food. Because classically, you know, Indian food is not paired with wine. I mean, right. the new world works really, really well. With it. But having said that, it doesn't mean that the great Burgundies or great Bordeaux or any other place or Italians don't work with Indian food. They do. I just think the vintage becomes slightly less relevant, especially if you're pairing it. Enjoy it. <laughs> I don't try to pair it. Right. Yeah, I, mean, I agree. I agree. I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily work with anything that is too subtle, that's too elegant. I mean, Indian food is robust, it's loud, it's energetic, it's out there. And so wines that have those characteristics are also a good match. Anything that's going to be too subtle, too lean and crisp, you don't want anything that's going to hide. Uh, you want something that's going to show itself and, and be a little bit more exuberant. Right. Good advice. Is there anything more you want to say about the sparkling wine and uh, spicy food? The only thing I would say is uh, I was in South Africa uh, last year. And obviously, South Africa produces beautiful sparkling whites from Shannon or Pinot Noirs as well, some great ones. I was uh, at a winery. I was staying there. I had a fabulous time. We had some wine. We were all sitting around, and then all of us kind of left our room and went back to bed. And I was supposed to brush my teeth. And I felt that it would be so wrong because there was this much sparkling left in the bottle. And I was like, it is just such a sin to waste this beautiful. So I actually put that little bit of bubble on my toothbrush <laughs> and I brushed my teeth with champagne because I didn't want it to go waste. I think there's a new branding opportunity there. I mean, we've got Sensodyne, but this is a whole lot more interesting as toothpaste or champagne some product. Yeah, that's right. No, I didn't use the toothpaste. I just used yes, the, the champagne. Yeah, yeah. I was like, why should I let it go waste? I just I used it and I bottled my mouth with it and it was delicious. <laughs> that's fun. What a fun idea. i got to try that. I um, wish more people would drink sparkling wine throughout the meal. Yes, exactly. Start off with it. Because it does work so well with so much, so many different foods. It does. And everybody just thinks it's for toasting or at the beginning or just an aperitif. But you can drink this. And the beauty of it is it's got lots of flavor and zest, but it's also low alcohol. So it's a nice way of pacing throughout a, a holiday meal or any meal, really. Yeah. And you don't want to be asleep on the sofa at seven. So it's, it's quite nice that way. 12% Perfect. is usually where the alcohol clocks in at. Right on. So, gentlemen... What do we have next for pairing? Which wine and which direction are we going? All right. Now we're getting into fun stuff because okay. this is one of Vikram and my favorite styles of wine, uh, favorite grapes. Now Riesling. we're doing Riesling. Yay, Riesling. Yes. Okay. So Riesling is such a versatile grape and you've got yours as well. So that's I fantastic. I do. I have the Kung Fu girl from Washington yes. State. Off dry Riesling. So we are doing the St. Urban's Hof Nick Weiss selection urban from the Mosul in Germany. Awesome. Riesling can be made in so many different styles. You can have bone dry, crisp Riesling. There's Riesling sparkling wine. If you uh, go to Germany, you can get sex. And then you can have sweeter styles of Riesling moving into off dry, medium dry, and even dessert wines. So because it's so versatile, it plays that way with food as well. Bone dry Rieslings can work really well in place of stuff like sparkling wine, where you need to cut through that fattiness, the richness of fried foods or cream or anything heavy. If you have a wine that's got a little bit of sweetness like this one does, you can play it off of things that have some chili, have some extra spice, have a little bit of heat that needs taming. The best thing about this wine is that it's not just about the sugar. It's also about the acidity. It's about how it balances itself. It walks this tightrope of sweetness and acidity that keeps it very, very fresh and very balanced. 
And a lot of people talk about Gewürztraminer as a pairing for spicy food. That's true. And while Gewürztraminer has one side of that tightrope, it has the sweetness, it has the aromatics, it doesn't always have enough acidity to yes. play off of that sweetness. So I generally find Riesling to be a better pair for more spicy dishes, uh, more complexity and, and freshness than Gewürztraminer or other aromatic whites with sweetness. That's an excellent point, Sean, because I think Gewürz, if I'm not mistaken, translates to spice. And so we always think spice wine, it's the (laughs) default over and over again. But you're right. There's an edginess, a raciness to Riesling that isn't always there with Gewürztraminer. And I would think, yeah, it makes a much better That's not to say that Gewürztraminer can't pair with spicy food. I have some Gewürztraminer at the restaurant and there's some that are just outstanding, but it has to be handled carefully. It has to be managed and made to work with food. Sure. And having studied in Austria and Germany and worked there, obviously yeah. your bias would go to the Bruno Veneclinas and the Rieslings because your first taste of wines is coming from there. You know, the Bruno Veneclinas and taste them, you're like, now I understand. Or the Rieslings from Austria or from Germany. Yeah. When you look at these wines, right. I think what, what I love about these wines, again, is that you can drink a full bottle of it and feel totally fine because it doesn't tire your palate. No, you don't true. feel that mouth feel yeah. as if like, oh my God, my palate is tired. That sometimes can be a little overpowering and overbearing because when your palate gets tired, you become a little lethargic. And this way, this wine will keep you fresh and wanting more and not feel like I'm feeling a little overwhelmed by my palate. Exactly. You know, and I was just reading with like a tannic wine, like a tannic Cabernet, which I would think would be one of the less good wines to pair with Indian cuisine. Every sip dries your mouth out further because the tannins are taking the proteins out of your saliva and agglomerating or coming together. So your first sip is drying. Your second sip is more drying and it keeps going and going. Whereas this is just mouth-watering and mouth-watering and juicy and giving, like to your point, Vikram. Yeah, so true. Yeah. So what do we put with this, gentlemen, this Riesling? We have a fantastic dish on the menu that's been there. I think it's one of the original dishes, the jackfruit. Yes. It's a tomato curry made with black cardamom and cumin. So you get this deep, rich, smoky tomato curry. Uh, there's a roasted jackfruit heart, which for anybody that hasn't had young jackfruit, the texture of it's kind of like an artichoke heart. Yeah, it's this slightly fibrous vegetable. Uh, works really well to take on sure. all the flavor of that sauce. And then we top it with a little bit of pickled ginger and, and chilies. So it has some heat. It has some spice, a little bit of that snap. And Riesling works great to both tame the chili, to pair with the elements that smoke and spice from the ginger, and to keep it refreshing. Hmm. Wow. And so, and, yeah, go ahead. Jackfruit is, is a typical... Southeast Asian kind of a fruit. It almost tastes like meat. So if you're a vegetarian and don't want to eat meat, you would eat a jackfruit because it has the texture. So that mouth feel of that, the beautiful acidity that comes from the ginger and the smokiness that comes from the black cardamom just pairs really well with the reasoning. Wow. The wine and the food descriptions make my mouth water. (laughs) You're doing your job. Would you say the balance of your list is more whites and sparklings than reds? No, actually, it's pretty equal. We do have a large selection of reds as well. It's it's pretty tame. We have about 120 selections on our wine list right now. Okay. Yeah, about half and half are, are white and red. And then we've got about 20 sparkling wines, 15 sparkling wines, and then a couple of rosés as well, five, 10 rosés. So. Oh, beautiful. So when you make a wine list up, you don't just say, I'm going to only have white or only have red because everybody's palette is different. Yeah, sure. I mean, the beautiful part about life is that this is a democracy of palettes. Nice you way to put it. You want, however you want it. So somebody might just say, I want a white chutanath. I want a new world Syrah from Asarobos, for example. People want that. And, and you should totally, totally be there. Who are you to judge and say, no, this doesn't work with everything. So you pair wines, or you put wines on the list that pleases everybody. Sure, absolutely. So how many wines by the glass, Sean? Right now, wines by the glass, I think we have seven whites by the glass, and then eight reds, and then four sparkling. That's Wow, that's really impressive. 
five sparkling. My mistake. We have five sparkling. So we're really trying to push that. We do everything from Prosecco for twelve fifty a glass to the Contrato, which we have for seventeen. Uh, reserve Blue Mountain Brutes that we do by the glass, mm. as well as Moet Champagne and Krug as well. We pour by the glass, basically at cost. We'd really like people to experience what Krug is and, and how it is the uh, the king of champagnes and is a, a leader in the champagne world. And it's great with our fruit. It's not cheap. Like to go out and buy a bottle is almost $300, <laughs> or you can have a glass at the restaurant for $50. So, Oh, yeah, it's an amazing wine. Lee says, any Canadian sparklings on the menu? Well, they did mention Blue Mountain leaves. Yeah. don't know if you have any others or if you were able to uh, get Ontario. Sparklings right now. No, we don't have anything from Ontario. We've had the Benjamin Bridge. Oh, yes, from uh, Nova Scotia. Nova Scotia yeah. as well on the, in the past. The selection of Ontario wines in British Columbia is a little bit limited. I mean, there's some interprovincial trade yep. kind of boundaries there, but there is some great BC sparklings available as yeah. well. So. At my third restaurant, my Shanti, I have Blue Mountain by the glass uh, available there, and I do a fantastic job. Sipes does a fantastic job as well. So, you know, again, the idea is that there is great, great BC wines available or, you know, Canadian wines available to us in this country. Absolutely. All right. So we have dealt with the Riesling. Now let's mm-hmm. move on to a red. So which reds are we? All right. So what we've got that we're doing is a, a New World Syrah. Yes. So this is, let's see if I can get some light that doesn't Via pin. Via pin. This is their Cuvée Violette Syrah. Okay. So this is an aromatic, spicy, floral, fruit forward, New World Syrah. Mm. Uh, Syrah does wonderful things with spicy food. It carries some of those spice characters itself. It has some of that pepperiness, that little bit of earthy character, like the cardamom, the black cardamom, the cumin. And then when you throw it up against something that's got a little more weight and structure and spice, it not only elevates both the wine and the food, it also serves to refresh because Syrah and Shiraz, as we know, tend to be a little bit higher in acidity and freshness. So doing something like this, it has a touch of that smokiness, that peppery, the floral notes uh, is just awesome. Absolutely. And I find the texture of Syrah is so lovely. Like it's like velvet, liquid velvet. It just fills your mouth and there's not a lot of the harsh tannins, nothing grippy. Everything's slippery, slidey. <laughs> it goes down and, uh, quick. <laughs> it's not to say that wines that have tannin don't pair with spicy food. We okay. have... We have everything from New World Pinot Noir all the way up to Barolo on the list. So we have a wide range of styles to suit every person. People will often come into the restaurant and they'll say, what wine pairs with Indian food? That's like saying, what wine pairs with European food? There's so much variety. There's so many different styles. Even in our, our limited menu, you can go from deep, rich, smoky tomato curries all the way up to rich, heavy cream. So yeah. picking one wine to pair with everything is almost impossible. Sure. And if I find one wine that you enjoy and then you have food with it, that's what makes it a great pairing as well. It's, it's about what you want and what you will enjoy and what you want to share with your friends and family. Absolutely. Now, going back to you say you have some tannic wines and mm-hmm. they will work with Indian or spicy foods. How does Absolutely. that work? Because I always thought avoid tannic wines altogether. Right. So uh, the effect of tannins on your mouth, what you were talking about, where they got onto, onto proteins. Mm. Indian food is full of proteins. So throwing the, this tannic nebbiolo at something like the braised short rib ah, uh, yes. would be awesome because you have this rich, fatty short rib loin that's been slow braised. It's served in this tomato so curry with the grilled kale. Mm. And then you have a sip of this rich, spicy, earthy tannic nebbiolo. And it uh, dissolves those fatty compounds in it. Uh, it softens everything. Nice. The tannins kind of melt away into the meat. The meat melts away into your mouth. And then you take both. And then you can go back for another sip because you've been refreshed. Again, you see this wine between all of the wines. And that's acidity. Wow. Acidity is the key to pairing wine with food. The Italians figured this out a long, long time ago. All of their wines are acid bombs. And that's, that's true. Yeah. That is why their wine is so good with food, because that's what they focus on. Wine is food. Yes, that's true. And now how about the other challenger, wines with high alcohol? You've got the heat of spice 
or not always heat, but when you do have heat and spice, isn't that a clash? Sometimes uh, it depends on how the wine carries the alcohol. It just it just tires your palate out faster. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, is it something wrong? I mean, you know, if you find your palate being tired of uh, having a heavy, heavy duty, uh, either a Syrah or a Petit Verdot style, those are like you know, heavy or Tanant style, those those really jammy style yeah. wines, and you want to have it, then your palate will get tired. But I mean, who's stopping you from enjoying it? I think it's yeah. That that world makes that kind of wine, and it, that's the style behind it. Or you know, if you're having petit sera from Paso Robles, or like any of those regions which are like super hot, you're going to find the wines at fourteen point five, almost fifteen percent high in alcohol. You literally can only have one glass of it because after that your palate is going to get tired. Yeah, sure. But no, nobody used to say that they don't care. They care really well. I think this was last year we were um, invited to cook for the royals at Mission Hill. And when we got the call to say, you, you know, you're going to be one of the chefs that's going to be invited to cook for the royals, you have to understand, as an Indian, when you've been ruled for 200 years, you, you have a little chip over your shoulder. <laughs> so you decide to say something like, you know, say something to her that every paparazzi was there. I was like, I'm going to say something subtle, like, you know, thanks for leaving India or something like this. <laughs> in, my mind, in my mind, I'm like, I'm going to say something really, that had you not... You know, we would have, we were, I would have never ended up in this great country called Canada. Like, just all these things are going through my mind. And obviously, when Kate and William, they come towards my table, yeah. and she's so nice and friendly that I just literally melted like butter. Yeah. <laughs> oh, she was so nice and friendly. Uh, you know, she had a glass of wine. They had a Mission Hill wine, and I made some lamb popsicles for them, and then they absolutely enjoyed it. And that hit the media, your lamb popsicles, because yeah. she loved them so much? Is that She loved them so much. And the part was that I had done some homework and found out that on the wedding night, that was the main course that was served ah. to the guests that day. So I said that to both of them, and they were very friendly and very nice. Now, your friend said she's a commoner, so she's had Indian food before. Okay. But I don't think he's had much of Indian food before. So as soon as I... Yeah, I gave him the lamb popsicles and he ate it. Like his face just went like red because <laughs> of the spices sure. that in there. And he just went like, whoa, this is this is delicious. <laughs> and then he took a sip of a little sip of the wine and then just, just enjoyed it. My first reaction was, I got you. It was beautiful. And and the, it so it was also the moment we were there, you know, it was nice, it was a gorgeous sunny day where you are. So the surroundings mean so much. You know, if you're drinking a nice glass of red wine and there's a fireplace going on and it's cozy and comfortable and you're having comfort Indian food, then that's the feeling that you're going to get. Absolutely. So I want to ask you a few more questions before we wrap this up. So to each of you, starting with you, Sean, if you could share a bottle of wine with anyone, living or dead, who would that be and why? Oh, uh, <laughs> I think if I was going to share a bottle of wine with anybody, it would be my great grandfather. Oh yeah. He passed away when I was about 14, 15. Oh, wow. So I, I never got to be an adult with him mm-hmm. and he was such an inspiration. He was born in Cornwall. He came over to Canada as a young boy. He established himself here. He started a number of companies in, in British Columbia and he worked through a very challenging period in the growth of this country. And I just, I would love to hear some of his stories as an adult and to be able to share a moment with him back and forth, have some wine, tell him about what I'm doing and how passionate I am about the things that I love. That would be really awesome. That's lovely. Vikram? And I think I would not um, want to share a glass of wine with him because that man doesn't drink. But so what I would do is, I would give him a cup of chai, okay. and his name is Gandhi. I would love to meet Gandhi one day. Yes. I would hold a glass of wine because I know he would not judge me for holding a glass of wine, but I would make him a cup of chai and give it to him. And I would love to listen to him and say, what motivated you to free India, to go through so much hardship in a loincloth, and why does money not motivate you? And how he single-handedly changed a course of a nation 
and the legacy that he has left behind. If I could be part of that thought process, I would love to sit down with him and you know, have some chai and some wine with him. Wow. I'll drink to that. I'll drink to both your memories. Awesome. Cheers. Yes. <laughs> so go ahead. And uh, now as we wrap up, is there anything that we haven't covered that you'd like to mention? I, I think one of the things I really want to mention is that a butter chicken is not <laughs> old Indian cuisine. No. Okay. It is just one dish. It's like saying croque monsieur or French onion soup is French cooking (laughs) or steak fritz is French cooking. There's so much more to Indian food. Uh, Go travel to India, go to Southeast Asia and see what a great country and the spices and the permutations and combinations. I was just in Vietnam three years ago and honestly, the young chefs over there are pairing great burgundies, even though they're slightly cooked because by the time it gets to Vietnam, they have the beautiful uh, young yellow golden straw color, which you know it's because of the heat. Yes. By the time it goes there, it's just aged a little bit faster. But they're pairing it with bugs. They're pairing it with tarantulas. They're pairing it with those beautiful little wow. things that, that they eat. And it's, it's incredible so cool. to taste. I mean, I had a cockroach, and the guy had a pairing of deep-fried cockroach with beautiful flavors. And I was like, wow. So go and travel to these countries that are developing basically and experience their side of food and wine pairings. You'll be impressed to come back and say, wow, the total different way of thinking. Yeah. Yeah, I've got, I've got to try that tarantula with mature burgundy. That's an interesting (laughs) match. All right, Sean, anything Uh, else you want to mention? I just think that people should, just take into consideration the experimentation. And, and that's been some of the most fun in the time that I've spent at Vigis is getting to try things, getting to throw something new out there. And, and unexpected pairings are always the most fun. Uh, when you get a dish and you're like, I want to try something like this. A Sherry ambassador come into the restaurant and she brought a bunch of Sherry and you're not, that's not something that you're thinking about. And one in particular was a, was a PX sherry. So it was a, it was a sweet sherry made from Pedro Jimenez. And it had very rich, deep, dark flavors and, and a lot of sweetness. And I said, let me try something. And I brought them a little plate of our venison, which is done with a date tamarind chutney. Gorgeous. Uh, and grilled vegetables. It has this smokiness. You would never think to pair a sweet sherry with a meaty venison loin, but the fact that it had this sauce with the tamarind and the dates, the sweetness balanced it and it, and it made for a fantastic pairing. So just go out on the limb, try something new. If you think it might work, then try it and see what happens. And then go and tell your friends and come to the restaurant and tell me about a thing that you had that you really loved. And I'll see if I can do something fun for you as well. Fantastic. Yes. And we should all go to Vidge's restaurant in Vancouver. What's the website? Vidges.ca. .ca. Vidges.ca is the restaurant. So whenever you're in Vancouver, or for those of you who are tuning in from Vancouver, go. I'm going to go. I've got to make the Mecca, the journey. (laughs) Awesome. This was such a great conversation, educational, but also very entertaining. The stories were amazing. I thank you both. Vikram, Sean. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, we'll bid adieu and good night to you now. All the best for you both for everything that you're working on. Great. Thank you so much. Namaste. I appreciate it. And namaste to all the young chefs. Be the mentors to the young people. Let them experience great food and great wine. You know, we in Canada are a culinary destination. Yes. We have what it takes. Let's make sure that the world knows that we are a culinary destination. All right. Awesome. All right. Rally and cry at the end there. Cheers to you both. (laughs) Take care. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this chat with Vikram Vidge and Sean Nelson. Here are my takeaways. Number one, I love how Vidge describes a restaurant as being on stage and a performance for the guests. The guests, in turn, bring to the table a democracy of palates. Wonderful phrase. I know personally I've always loved the drama and theater of dining out. 
Number two, I equally loved Sean's description of tasting his first great wine. He says he didn't know that a wine could do the things it did. I think we all have a memory of our first wine that moved us to become passionate about learning more about it. Number three, Vikram shares some interesting developments about the Indian wine industry. There was also an article recently in the Sunday New York Times about that. I'm so curious to try Indian wines. I'd love to hear from you if you've tried any and what you'd recommend. Number four, Sean made my mouth water with his pairing of sparkling wine and spicier, heavier Indian dishes. How the bubbles and acidity cut through the fat and cream and heat. I like how he characterizes Indian food as loud and energetic and that it needs an equally expressive wine. And finally, number five, I think the best tip is clearing up the misperception that Gewürztraminer, which translates to spice wine, should always be our default pairing with spicy food when it often doesn't have the acidity or off-dry character that Riesling does. Go Riesling! If you like this episode, please tell a friend about it, especially one who's interested in the great wine and food pairing tips that Vikram and Sean shared. You'll find links to their websites, social media handles, the video version of this conversation, and where you can find us on Facebook Live every second Wednesday at 7 p.m. in the show notes at nataliemclean.com forward slash 68. Finally, if you want to connect with me personally, join me in a free online video class at nataliemclean.com forward slash class. Thank you for taking the time to join me here. I hope something great is in your glass this week, perhaps a wine that pairs perfectly with your favorite spicy dish. You don't want to miss one juicy episode of this podcast, especially the secret full-bodied bonus episodes that I don't announce on social media. So subscribe for free now at nataliemclean.com forward slash subscribe. Meet me here next week. Cheers. Cheers.